Now, a question specifically for Dr. Ng. You work in pulsars, which is a very fascinating area of of astronomy, and at one point was sort of half-jokingly blamed on aliens. Tell us about your work with discovering pulsars. I worked on searching for pulsars for my PhD project. Back then, I used the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia, and the idea is to basically point the telescope to a every point in the sky and analyze the data to see if there were pulsars that were not previously that have not previously been seen before the way we look for pulsars is by detecting any periodicity in the data because pulsars tend to have radio emission in its two pole and every time when the emission axis comes into our line of sight we see a pulse and just like how it works in a lighthouse, will detect these periodic pulses. That's also what it gives its name. So I used Pox radio telescope and discovered 60 new pulsars that were not previously detected before. Yeah, so you look and you just see boom, 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 periodic, and that's the rotating pulsar. Now, what does a pulsar look like radio-wise? Is it hugely broadband as opposed to these narrowband signals? Yes, that's correct. Now, what might we learn about gravitational waves from studying pulsars? One very interesting application of pulsar science is that there are these millisecond pulsars, which are pulsars that spin extremely rapidly and they are extremely stable in their rotation, which means that we can effectively use them as cosmic, as cosmic clocks. Having these pulsars in all different locations in the sky, these clocks in different locations in the sky. And the idea is that if a gravitational wave is passing through space-time, these gravitational waves will affect these very regular pulses of these pulsars in a correlated manner. So pulsars that are from certain area of the sky will be delayed, will all be delayed and whereas the other one from another part of the sky might all be uh, coming a little faster earlier than we expected. So by cross-checking this correlated deviation in the arrival time of these otherwise regular pulses, we might be able to infer whether there is gravitational waves in the space-time. Now, fast radio bursts. Now, this is another area of radio astronomy that has been of great interest lately, but there, it has been floated that maybe it's a techno signature, or maybe some of them are a techno signature. And they have the virtue of uh, a few of them anyway repeating. Do you think that that's a fruitful area, Dr. Ng, to look and see if we're detecting techno signatures as fast radio bursts? Yeah, I was just talking about this to Ross before you joined, and we haven't. We don't know the exact origin of every. Well, okay, let's start with what we know. We <laughs> uh, we have now detected over a thousand fast radio bursts, and a handful of them. We think we know what they are. That they are coming from magnetars, which are very magnetic uh, neutron stars. Now we we do think there seem to be multiple classes of fast radio bursts, and that it could be the case that there are different types of fast radio bursts, that they come from different origins, it's possible. Like, maybe magnetar is not the answer to everything. Now, we don't think they are uh, alien signals, though. And the most convincing explanation I've heard is that by now we've detected fast radio bursts from many different locations in the sky and of very different distances. Now, it would be rather strange if all these different FRBs are from alien civilization and how would they have communicated among themselves to all agreed to transmit the same kind of signals that we're detecting as fast radio bursts. So this is one explanation that I believe in. And the other is how we did, how these fast radio bursts burst are so short in time, which means that they must have been emitted from compact sources, something like, a, something like a neutron star. That's pretty amazing though, in and of itself, just, just as a natural signal, because the, <laughs> 
it's almost like this. You can study birds, but there are very many different types of birds. There's a big difference between an ostrich and a sparrow. So it might be that we're just simply looking at something too broadly, maybe, as in the fast radio bursts, rather than trying to categorize them. Do you see that as a problem? Yeah, it's, it's possible that the, you know, are very different types of birds, as you described it. I think we have learned a lot in the last years or so. Like, for example, how Chime has detected all this, like over a thousand fast radio bursts, and that has really helped us solve this puzzle. Like, as you, as you mentioned, there are some FRBs that repeat and some that don't, but is it really true that they are different or could it be that those that appear to not appear to not repeat? Maybe they just, maybe we just haven't looked at them long enough to see them repeat. Maybe they all repeat or maybe they don't. We just don't have the answer yet. It's sort of the same problem as alien radio signals. You got to look and you got to look for a long time. Yeah, I think indeed, like one of the future of radio astronomy is like, can we really have a sensitive telescope, but at the same time, look at the whole sky all the time. Traditionally, radio astronomy is a lot about single dishes, big radio telescopes like Arecibo, for example. It's a really massive dish that is super sensitive, but it only can look at sort of one spot or a few spots of the sky at a time. So how can we build a telescope that is at the same time sensitive, but also with a large field of view that it can give us the whole sky? All sky, Seti. It must be the future. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. 